It's a great pleasure to be speaking to you, even though from afar. Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, things which we've learned during the long experience of running not just this kind of hackfest, but um, the development of e-science applications in general. Um, as you probably know, uh, Roberto and his team have a very long experience with this, uh, several years in fact. And uh, I have been trying to provide infrastructure for these inf applications um, for just about as long in Africa. So there's a couple of um, which suggestions or guidelines which uh, we've we've discovered along the way, along with uh, best practices from the rest of the world, um, and by that I mean uh, kind of uh, the kind of work that's been done on web applications, that uh, we'd like you to keep in mind. So uh, let's dive into it. First slide. Um, the question that we all come in our minds when we start this event is basically what are we even doing here? Uh, most of you have a pretty good idea of what you want to build, but you may not have a very good idea of where that applies application or that service is actually going to be running in production uh, and how people are going to be using it and so on. So yeah, you have a good idea, but um, you're not really sure about the endpoints. So we need to keep some things in mind. Um, first of all, we, we live in a very big, wild place. Um, the web, just like Africa, is, is big and wild. There's many, many freedoms. There's, you think you have the freedom to do many things. But in fact, sometimes those freedoms work against you in the sense that it's, it's difficult to collaborate or uh, have your things uh, run on many places. It's also evolving very rapidly. I'm sure most of you can remember a time when there was very little or no internet access, um, when most of the software that you had to use uh, cost a lot of money and so on, and uh, there wasn't a much choice for uh, deploying even writing applications. And now we can do this quite easily. So you need to have a very good awareness of what's going on around you, um, and that will help you to make some good choices, or at least avoid certain bad choices. So while you go through these two weeks in developing your applications and your services, um, we are also trying to improve this actual event. As Roberto said, um, this is the third time we're running it, and uh, every time we run it, we try to learn from you uh, the, the ways which we do things, the ways in which you would like to do things, and so on. Thinking about um, existing patterns, which we will go through in this presentation, but we want you to actively think about what you're doing so that you can help us to identify new patterns, especially in the way in which we run this course. Okay, so Roberto showed you his uh, screenshots or the, the web page for what we call a platform for open science. Um, I was following just now the live stream, so I know you guys have been told about this. You know that it's a clickable map, etc. What we want you to keep in mind is that this is not the platform. There's many, many projects out there which are calling themselves the various combinations of platform, open, and science. Um, and they're all very different things. I think what makes our interpretation different is that all of the components which you see here are generic. So they can be installed with various different kinds of services offering the same functionality. So you can have different kinds of fora, you can have different kinds of e-learning systems, different kinds of computing platforms. But they the important thing is that they interact with each other, as Roberto said, via these REST APIs. Why via REST APIs and not other way? Uh, well, that's just because it's a very complex place and the, the way in which you get lots of different components together on the web is via REST APIs. So here's the outline of the presentation. Um, why are we going to talk about patterns? Uh, there's a good re reason that we're talking about patterns and web application hosting services like Heroku, um, about what makes a good web application. Uh, we've seen the rise of cloud computing. We've seen applications being called cloud native. And we want you to keep in mind that this is the direction in which things are going and uh, the various uh, aspects of an application which make it cloud native. Um, this is the so-called 12-factor application, which I'll go into. And then a um, not necessarily a, um, a practice, but a pattern of continuous integration. Um, this is a method of writing and testing code such that it's always ready to be used. Um, it's one thing to develop your application, um, but we are also developing the place where the application will run. So we're going to be speaking about what you can expect from infrastructure to be able to host your application and the, applic and the scientific applications that it may need to execute. And here I'll go into the various patterns of how um, e-science infrastructure works. 
Then there's a few patterns in research which we would like you to keep in mind. Um, basically, we're going to explain a little bit what we mean by open science and uh, particularly as it pertains to data. The last one that we'll speak about are integration patterns and these are the ways in which you uh, bring your components of the open science platform together to offer a service to the community. Okay, so why do we talk about patterns? Um, I've got two quotes here which come from a very good reference website called sourcemaking.com uh, and there they speak about two things. First of all, design patterns and design anti-patterns. Now remember we're speaking about design, not implementation, and so these are aspects of, of whatever you're building which cut across whatever it is you're building. Mm -hmm. In software engineering, a design pattern can be a general repeatable solution to a commonly occurring problem. Okay, so that's not a finished design which you can transform directly into code. You mustn't think of it as a template. You must think of it as a way in which you can attack certain problems. Okay, That's all good and well, and if you read through those design patterns, most of them will probably make um, intuitive sense to you, but I think the more important one to read are those of anti-patterns. So these are habits which we find ourselves falling into to solve commonly occurring problems, which actually make the problem worse or make it bigger problems later down the line. Um, and in fact, these anti-patterns are probably the starting point for most of the thinking that you need to do before you start actually writing your applications. Okay, so um, I've got these two references in here. I'm just going to leave them as references and, and in your own time you can see what they're all about. So remember there's no right way to work on these projects. Um, all we asked for you to come to this meeting was that you knew the language of your choice and that you understood basically how you wanted to do it. Um, we don't make any specification that uh, the language needs to be any specific one or, or the topology of the application needs to be any specific one. Uh, you have total freedom about how to develop these applications. Um, and so we try to identify patterns by which good applications are identified. Right. Okay, so in the old days, and by the old days I mean about uh, five, ten years ago, not that old, um, basically the situation was as follow. If you wanted to do cutting edge research in a digital infrastructure, you basically had to deal with the command line. Almost all of the high performance computing or distributed computing infrastructures that were offered only offered access via command line. And so research workflows tended to be scripted. Um, if you had to do things on the command line, you wrote a couple of scripts which could be executed on the command line. And, um, and those generated out of them a, an experience about a set of good practices, basically how to run workflows on the command line. Eventually middleware stacks um, tried to make it easier to access distributed computing, so various aspects of the command line had to change. But still the research was typically done in scripts. Okay, So we've got this habit of implementing our research workflows in things like Bash or Perl or uh, maybe Python um, further down the line. Um, very few application stacks actually were there. So you can think about the classic ones of Root or you know, building things in Python, MATLAB and Octave. Um, these are still things which tend to be executed on the command line. So the language of research was pretty much static in the sense that you would write your workflow and it would execute once on the command line and then you would start over again. And the web was also like that. The web was also pretty much static HTML and the browser was basically like your like your client, like the command line. Um, you would look at one page at a time and then maybe make individual changes to them. There was no dynamic exchange of data. And so it's good, we've got a lot of work done like that, but it's not great for scientific work, especially when it comes to interactivity. So what we've seen, especially with the increase in bandwidth, is that the features of our browsers have become extremely rich, in some cases replacing the entire functionality of a desktop. So you can run almost everything that you need to do work right in your browser, that's the only application you need. The web is not just for reading anymore, but it's for creating, it's a very creative tool, and especially for collaborating. Most of the features of the command line have now been replicated on the web. Um, if you think about running DNA sequencing, uh, you would need to download a special application, compile it, and then execute that on the command line. Well, now you can upload your DNA sequence to a web service and get the results right back. 
So the web, more than the command line, has tended to become one of the most important tools for scientific discovery. You have all of the functionality of the command line. Um, most of the applications which we executed on the command line are now executable via web interfaces. But we have all of the other things that the web provides as well. But we still need certain things to manage our workloads, to, to execute and to store our data. And so we still need access to platforms for computing. These are our high performance computing centers, our distributed computing centers. And we need a specific application stack for our scientific work. So you may think to yourself, well, great, you know, I've got this new tool. Um, it's the web, it's awesome. I'm going to build a web app so that people can use my service or my application easily via the web. And they don't have to have special access to uh, uh, the things that you see in the last layer, the knowledge base, the open access repository, and the science gateway, and so on, these live on the web. And particularly in the science gateway, these host the applications which we execute further down the layer of the open science platform in the commons. So in the commons, you don't explicitly use web technologies. We don't say that these have to live on the web or be part of the web, but they have one thing in common, and that is a set of open standards, which makes the web what it is. Uh, you know that you can uh, basically interact with any web page via a browser. And so that's interactivity, that, sorry, that's interoperability is what makes the web such a good place. So the first pattern we see here is that of inter interoperability. We need our services and our applications to easily interact via standard language or stack with the various components of the science plat of, the, of the open science platform. Okay, so you may think, okay, I can do that, no problem. Uh, which standards to adhere to? That's the problem. Interoperability is good, I just need to know. Uh, but the problem is that there are many, many, many of these, and there's no real way to tell you what to do. Because the web is a pretty wild place, there's, there's just freedom to do anything you want, which that's also the reason why it took off so well. Um, so we need to think a little bit about how this web application is going to live and evolve, right? It's one thing to write a PHP code on your laptop and say, okay, well, you know, I can just deploy this to a web server, but then is that web server going to scale? Is the application doing the right thing? What happens if that web server goes down? All of the problems associated with um, not just scale, but also evolution need to be thought about. Your application will run on some infrastructure and uh, what we're trying to do with these hackfests is to motivate um, research providers, so NRENs, to provide these infrastructures. Um, and here I'm referring to basically uh, cloud installations or uh, computing platforms. Okay, so we're going to go into a couple of patterns um, of what these applications should look like such that it makes it easier for them to live on various infrastructures. Okay, so we're going to start with patterns in applications. Okay, so 12 factor applications. You may or may not have heard this term before. Um, it's a relatively, relatively new one. This comes out, out of uh, basically uh, well, a few years of experience actually running applications. Um, it comes from a company called Heroku, which is one of the biggest uh, uh, web application hosters. And these are aspects or factors of an application which makes it more likely to be easier to deploy on different kinds of infrastructures. So we're going to go through them. And I want you, you may not remember all of them, but you need to remember the website, 12factor.net, so that you can ask yourself whether the way in which you're developing your application respects these. Bear in mind that not all of these applications, sorry, not all of these factors will be applicable to your application. Some of them may not make sense, but these are good practice suggestions. Right, so let's go through them. A clean contract means that there is a very clear installation and the, the service which hosts it. So you don't have any explicit declaration of where to run um, the application, uh, 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 hard-coded paths in the application configuration, specific hard-coded um, variables such as the ports or the URL. Um, that means that you can have the same contract, that means you know, trying to execute this application on various different places which may have different internal configurations. Okay, um, a 12-factor application is also suitable for deployment on what's called modern cloud platforms. So that means that you shouldn't require the need for a server yourself. You can have one, you can host this yourself, but you shouldn't require that. Then a 12-factor application minimizes the divergence between development and production. So 
So this is actually a, a very important aspect for the next two weeks. The way in which you develop your application in the development environment should be as close as possible to the way in which it will actually run in the deployment environment. So you may not even know what the deployment environment is, so you need to simulate that. And uh, and so we've gone to a little bit of length to provide you with such a simulated environment, which we will tell you about um, as the days go by. Okay. The last one on this page may not be all that relevant, and that is that applications should be able to scale up without significant changes to tooling. So if you're using a database, that database should be replicable. If you're using a web server, you should be able to provide that web server in a high availability configuration, et cetera. Slide that starts with a code base. Okay, so code base, this is basically where you will be putting your hands on the keyboard. The suggestions for a good 12-factor application is that the code base should be tracked in revision control and you should be able to deploy many deploys from one revision control, one, one service. Okay, so don't keep too many branches in there and don't make sure that there's a well-known central place where the deploys happen from. Um, this may not be uh, intuitive to you, but you should get into the habit of making sure that if your code is not in the revision control, basically it doesn't exist, okay? so. Um, the cycle of editing, testing, committing, and pushing should become second nature to you. This just shows a picture of what we mean by uh, having several deploys from a specific code base. Uh, the code base should be instantiable using different variables for different environments. So you've got the first developer's environments, the second developer's environments. These are maybe two people in a team which are working on the same application. And they use the same code base, although they may have slightly different testing environments. When they try to pull things into the production environments where the application will actually live, then you have a staging environment where these two things are tested. And if tests pass, the same code base gets pushed into production. Okay, so try to avoid two people working on the same application in two different repositories. Okay, so a good 12-factor application explicitly states what dependencies it has. Most of you will be writing applications in Python, PHP, or Ruby, uh, Ruby on Rails, that is. Um, maybe you have some Microsoft-based stack like ASP or .NET or something, but all of these have their own package management systems. And um, so this, these, are, these dependencies should not implicitly rely on something that's available on the system because you don't know where this application will be running. So you should have some declarative way to tell the system which dependencies your application has. Okay, you should also use a dependency isolation tool, whatever that is for your language stack, so that you don't leak in systems system dependencies. In other words, the application shouldn't by accident use something that's on the system that it should bundled together with itself. And the reasons for this are many, you're probably uh, bringing in some insecure or untested version of that dependency and so on. Okay, and the other thing is that you can't really test how your application is going to um, act in a production environment if you don't know that it's using the, only the dependencies that you explicitly state. Okay, so this is another thing that we're not used to um, in developing these applications. You need to explicitly describe the dependencies in a declarative. i am got you back again. So configuration, we, we often tend to store configuration in a configuration file. Uh, there's a couple of very bad reasons for that. So the suggestion for a 12-factor application is to store the configuration in the environment. Um, I won't go into the rest of the slide. Basically, that means that you can deploy the application with a different configuration by ex expressing variables in an environment. Okay, that means you can easily change the environments. This comes back to um, using the similar environments between uh, development and deployment and so on. Okay, number four, backing services. So backing services are things like um, the attached storage which you're using, maybe the uh, web service, sorry, the, the web server which you're using to expose this web, web application. Perhaps you have a messaging system or a caching system, anything that's the application itself doesn't do, but is necessary for the application to run. Okay, again, you will be deploying this application to a place where you don't have full control over the backing services. 
So the backing services should be uh, treated as attached resources, something that you can just plug into. And this comes back to the thing about having a clean contract with the, with the infrastructure provider. If you express everything that you need in the application, you will also be expressing your need for a database. And if the infrastructure provider can't provide you with that, then you know that you can't run your application there. Okay. So uh, basically treat uh, backing services as attached resources. So this is the evolution of the application. And the suggestion from, for a 12-factor application is to use strict separation between these environments. The build environment, and the release environment, and the run environment uh, into these three. Here is where that single code base is transformed via the setting of various variables. That's why it's important to separate them. You can keep the configuration in a file, but in something that can be instantiated at execution time. Okay, so build, release, and run, um, something that you will be dealing with later on in the Hackfest, not necessarily in the first few days, but uh, bear in mind that for you to do this properly, those three environments will be strictly separated. Shows you. Uh, pictorially how we separate these environments. Basically, you can see that the configuration, which is in an environment, is pulled in at the time um, that the application is built to be able to run the application. Okay, It's not kept together with the code base. So dev prod parity is something that uh, spends, or basically wastes a lot of time of people who are actually um, hosting this application in debugging. Often we get a request that says, uh, my application works when I tested it, but now when it's running on your site, it doesn't work, I uh, don't know what the problem is. And this comes down to the fact that most of the time there's a difference between the development environments and the production environments. So a good 12-factor application should keep those two environments exactly the same, barring certain variables. Okay, so what we suggest here is to keep the development, staging, and production environments as similar as possible. Now, you don't have control over the production environment because you don't own that, but you can simulate it. And that's what uh, we have provided for you in the beginning of this course, is a simulated environment which looks just like the place where, or as close as possible, to the place where your application will actually be running. Okay, the URLs or the names of the backing services may change, but the environment itself is exactly the same. And this is designed to keep down three gaps. Um, these are gaps which basically extend the amount of effort that it takes to run or maintain the application. The first one is the time gap. So the developer may work on this code that takes a lot of time, uh, put all their effort into it, and then when it comes to production time, there's more time necessary to debug the application if the dev prod parity is not maintained. The second one is the personnel gap. So if you think about the differences between various people in this, you have developers, operations engineers, and maybe some security engineers. Uh, if you're working in different environments, then those three people have to do all different kinds of work. If you have the same environment as a reference, then you don't have to um, even have an operation engineer because the site will just keep running perfectly. The third gap here is the tools gap. So in your development environment, you may be using one stack and the production environment, which is some cloud provider, may be using or exposing a different stack. And so you need to do more work as a developer to change your application to use that. This comes back to the clean contracts and dependencies that we mentioned before, the other two factors. So we've gone to a lot of trouble to ask you to express what your stack is. And we've also gone to a lot of trouble to simulate the, the production environment where your application will run, such that you can test the application in a development environment in the same way as it will run in a production environment. Okay, let's move on to um, the next bit of the presentation. That's that's all that we have to say about the 12 factor applications. I've just highlighted the, the 10 most important ones. There are two others which uh, I don't think are that relevant for this. But we're going to move on now to a practice called continuous integration. Continuous integration, um, there's basically not a, a well universally defined um, definition for it, but basically this came out of uh, many, many, many different groups kind of evolving towards the same practice. Um, you can read a very good definition or uh, um, uh, one of the good definitions at ThoughtWorks um, in the link that I provide on that slide. So continuous integration is a development practice that requires development to integrate code into a shared repository several times a day. Each check-in is verified by an automated build, allowing the teams to detect problems early. 
By integrating regularly, you can detect errors quickly and locate them more easily. So this requires a service to do all these things for you. Um, first of all, you have to check in the code because you're developing the code. Um, but bear in mind this important verb here, the, the automated build, right? This is extremely important. This is not something that should be done by hand. This, this is kind of a code referee which automatically checks everything that you do to see if there are problems. This is, this is particularly important if you're collaborating with someone. You may have conflicts in the code or so on. Um, but uh, we have again here provided a service for you to check these things. Now, it's up to you as a developer to express what needs to be checked. Um, as, again, many language stacks provide built-in uh, testing services. Uh, Ruby has RSpec, Python has knows uh, these kinds of things. You need to build these into your application along with the code. Okay. So continuous integration, if, if you are continuously integrating your code, there's more chance that it's going to be more robust and easier to deploy um, than if you're just hacking on it and you're not really sure what the, what the state of the code is. This describes um, the practices of continuous integration. It starts with CI practices. So again, we're just going to run through these quickly. Um, you don't have to do all of them, uh, but the more of them that you do, the you know that the more robust your application is going to be. So first of all, maintain the single source repository. Don't keep code left lying around in various places. If you do do that for uh, architectural reasons, make sure that the various repositories are added to a single one as submodules. Automate the build. Make sure that the build is automatable. So you need to express the way in which this application needs to be built in some kind of script. Make your build self-testing. So don't rely on a uh, user interface tester as a human being to go around and poke buttons on, web, on a web page. Uh, you can express these things automatically, and there are frameworks to be able to do that. Each commit should be built on an integration machine. And the integration machine should be exactly the same as the production environment. This is uh, building into the, the next two ones, that is keeping the build fast and testing the code in a clone of the production environment. So you don't push your code directly to the production ma machine. You keep it exactly the same as the production machine. And if the build passes, you get uh, a deployment happening. Make it easy for anyone to get the latest executable. Um, so that means basically tagging your code and releasing your code or keeping your code in, in an explicit branch that makes it easy to understand which one is the right one. Make sure that everybody can see what's happening. This means that the testers, the users, the application hoster, all of the people that are in, involved in actually providing this application, they should have access to the source code and access to the results of the build. And lastly, of course, try to automate the deployments just as you automate the integration. We are moving now onto, so we've moved out of patterns of development of applications and we're moving into patterns of execution, okay? How these applications, once built, tend to be deployed and executed uh, out there in the wild. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are building what's called kind of uh, batch or uh, high throughput applications. These are applications which may have uh, different kinds of interfaces, but when and they execute, they run on high throughput computing platforms. Um, these are kind of back-end applications. In any case, I'm going to go through the various patterns that we see in them. So um, grid computing patterns are basically, there's a few of them. Um, and so I put in here a reference for the different kinds of patterns that we see in distributed computing. To quote, whenever, where, whereas a consensus has been reached on defining the set of workflow patterns for business processes, no such patterns exist for workflows applied to scientific computing. Um, and that is because there are so many different things that need to be done in a research workflow. Usage patterns have emerged rather than rather through the reuse of community tools. So the patterns that we see when using distributed computing platforms are more driven by the platform itself rather than the need of the research community. Right, so this comes down to you know, uh, a certain middleware providing with a certain functionality, and so you tend to use that functionality to execute your workflow instead of the other way around. Uh, and that's just a historical artifact of the way these things were built. So for a full list of these uh, workflow patterns, I put in a reference at the bottom there. Um, it's a pretty old one, and uh, I'm still looking around for a good uh, review article of, uh, of a newer one, but it's, still, it's pretty good. So you can read all of them in there. When we talk about 
grid workflow patterns. Um, these are kind of fire and forget, um, batch, whatever you want to call it. There's basically two kinds of execution models. Um, you should take this into account when building the user interface of your application because you need to know that these kinds of executions will happen uh, and build your workflow in the user interface around them. Um, basically, there's parallel execution and pipelined execution. Obviously, this explains very well what it is. The parallel one means that many tasks are executed at the same time, and the pipeline one means that there is a sequence to which the tasks need to be executed. Of course, there is difference between compute parallelism and data parallelism that uh, comes down to basically the distribution of these tasks um, according to where the data is or according to where the CPU cores are. And uh, you know, there's no obvious way to do this. Uh, it really depends on from application to application. So if you have a, a parallel application, let's say you're running DNA sequencing or you're running um, the simulation of a weather model across various grids or uh, anything like that, that you can split up into individual tasks, um, then you have what we call grid parallelism. If your application is compute bound, then the workflows are quite simple and they can be easily partitioned depending on the nature of and the dependencies between these tasks. So you may have a very simple combination between uh, pipeline and parallel execution. Uh, again, I'm, I'm mentioning all of this because it comes into effect when you design the user interface. Um, you can easily set up an execution of a grid parallel uh, application with a very simple user interface. Uh, if you have something that requires more int interface data activity, then you need to work on a different user instance. Um, these can be defined as static data parallelism, so the data set doesn't change. Dynamic data parallelism, so the set of tasks changes according to changes in the data. And adaptive data parallelism, where both of these change at the same time. Okay, so um, you may not uh, recognize which of these patterns your application fits into, but these are the patterns that they could possibly fit into. So you should start to think about, okay, well, you know, what is my application doing now? Um, these are different kinds of parallel computing patterns with pipeline execution. Uh, again, these are kind of uh, industry terms, stuff that you will read in academic papers. Um, I'm leaving you a link at the bottom of this slide to describe all of the various kinds of tools which can be used to construct pipelines. That repository is just a, a list of tools which are used to construct pipelines on various platforms. So it's left there as a reference. Where we left off, we were talking about grid computing patterns uh, and the way in which applications tend to be executed on them. We're going to be speaking a little bit about now the cloud usage patterns. Uh, and this is very, very, very deep waters. This is something that you can run an entire conference on, let alone one specific uh, presentation. Um, but there, there is uh, some stability here that I'd like to just uh, um, have us refer to. Um, so the, the reference that I'm using here is something, a website called Cloud Computing Patterns. <laughs> it's exactly the same as the title of the slide. Um, and um, this tries to have a taxonomy of, uh, of ways in which we can use a, a cloud service to run science. Okay. So which kind of cloud workloads do we have? Basically, we can have a static workload where there's a service which stays up and provides a continuous uh, similar functionality. You can have periodic workload, which uh, is somewhat more elastic than the static workload. It's only available when people want it. Then you can have once in a lifetime workload where some configuration is constructed on the fly and then is executed and destroyed never to be run again. You can have unpredictable workload in the sense that you have a service which can construct for you the orchestration of the services that you need, but you don't know what they are a priori. Um, people can choose from a, a set of configurations, etc. And you can have something that's continuously changing. So uh, you don't, you don't, you can kind of predict what the workload is going to be, but it's changing over time. So whereas grids and high performance computers, they work very well under static or periodic or even once off work loads, um, you can think about uh, HPC in this sense, clouds are typically designed to deal with many different kinds of widely varying workloads. And so they are functionally a bit different to the ones we've seen before. Um, we're going to speak a bit about research patterns now um, as we go towards the end of the presentation. The first pattern that we want to recognize is pretty obvious. Uh, if you've come into this event, then you know, 
basically have an idea of what open science is. Uh, and you may have heard in Roberto's presentation about the fact that it's not necessarily a thing, it's a way of doing things. So it's a means, not an end. It's not, you don't do something to make it open science. You, you, you open your science so that you can do other things. And what are those things? These are things like to be able to reproduce your results, um, to be able to have others openly review and so improve the quality of your results, um, to be able to publish your results in a way that is accessible to as many people as possible, etc. That That is what open science is. It's a pattern of uh, doing science or conducting the things that we do in normal scientific day-to-day -day life. Not just the execution of the research, but also everything that comes after that, like review and, and uh, literature. So to be able to reproduce and validate research, we need our platforms to be able to do that too. We, we need things that are reproducible, that are accessible, um, etc. And so we, we, we bear in mind here that actually the, at the end of the day, the data of our research is the key. The, the, this is the product, the results of what we do in our open science day-to-day -day lives tries to zoom in on what we consider the important aspects of data in an open science paradigm. We refer to you to a term called FAIR data. FAIR is an acronym uh, standing for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Here it's used for data, but uh, this can be applied to other aspects of our open science platform, in particular the execution and data infrastructures. These also need to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And uh, there's a set of principles which guide how to make your data fair. Um, and these are maintained by the so-called FORCE 11 group. Um, that's the future of research infrastructures. FORCE 11, I've given the link there, and so you can see all of these principles in detail. Okay, so um, I'll leave you to read through those principles in your own time. But basically, remember that if you are building an application which which consumes or produces data, then you need to make it accessible, interoperable, you can't choose whatever format you like, um, reusable. So it must be some, somewhat semantically enriched. You need to understand how to use this data. Uh, and there's a set of principles which guide you to be able to make this data fair. What does it mean to be findable? So findable means that you must have your metadata associated with a globally unique and persistent identifier, okay? Essentially just the metadata, because the metadata will allow you to d discover the data itself. Um, but if the data is assigned a globally unique and, and eternally persistent identifier, that's also a good thing. The data should be described, obviously, with this metadata as far as possible. And the metadata should be registered or indexed in a searchable resource. Now, we're mostly um, comfortable with the fact that Google is indexing and uh, presenting all of our day-to-day -day, uh, life, the stuff that we put on the web. Um, and so we need to do that as well for our data. If we just put data on the web, it's not automatically registered and indexed in a place where people can find it. Okay. To be accessible. What does it mean to be accessible? The metadata must be retrievable by the identifier, not with some explicitly hard-coded URL or URI. So um, they must be uh, first of all findable in the first point, and the metadata must be retrievable using standard communications. So no special uh, username and access protocol and so on. Uh, basically, you should be able to find the metadata and retrieve it over the web. The protocol should be open, free, and universally implementable. That means that if you want to write an application which consumes this data, you shouldn't need to pay for a particular license for a protocol or codec or something. Um, that harkens back to uh, openness and accessibility. The protocol should allow for authentication and authorization where necessary, so not by default. Uh, the metadata should be accessible even when the data are no longer available, so you should be able to uh, describe this data and then even if the data are removed for their size or date or so on you should still be able to index that metadata that's why we mean there should be an eternally persistent identifier of the data so you can still refer to it in order to be in interoperable the metadata needs to use a formal accessible and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation so that's a bit of a mouthful but what it means is that you need to 
enrich the data with a human understandable and a machine understandable way of describing it. Uh, this can be XML, it can be JSON, it can be some specific uh, community description, um, but it must be formal and accessible in the sense that it can be easily translated into various formats. The data should use vocabularies that follow fair principles. So if you use a vocabulary that does not make things accessible or findable, then it's no good. The metadata should include qualified references to other metadata as well. That's a fairly technical one, but it just means that you can link various data sets. Lastly, to be reusable, that's the R in fair, uh, the metadata have to have a plural, plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. Uh, they must describe things like the date of creation, who owns them, how long it's supposed to live for, things like that. These are attributes of the metadata. The metadata are released with a clear and accessible license. This applies as well to the applications that we're using, but uh, releasing data without a license into the wild means that it's in essentially unusable because you don't know if you're going to get into trouble for publishing reanalyses of that data. So whatever that license is, if it's an open or closed license, should be attached to the data in the metadata. The data should be associated with their provenance, uh, which application generated these data, which research provided this data, how it was published, and so on. Um, otherwise, again, you have no idea whether or not you can trust or use this data. And then the metadata or the data itself should meet domain-relevant community standards. That means certain aspects of peer review, certain aspects of publishing workflow, and so on. These are all defined by the community itself, and there's no catch-all definition for them, but that makes your data trustworthy, reusable, understandable to uh, people coming down the line. And here we're coming back now to take a closer look at our open science platform. The platform of components and infrastructure which allows us to develop web applications which implement an open science workflow. On slide 37, we're going to zoom into infrastructure services. That is the bit in the comments with the black box around it, which is usually hidden away from um, the people developing applications, but which we critically depend on to be able to run uh, large workflows. So we need infrastructure services for our users. We need to authenticate and authorize them, and we need to manage their identity across the various underlying services, like, like workload and compute management, or data movement and storage, and so on. Often what people do is try to implement all of these aspects natively in their application. So either you may have a username and password in your application um, that blocks the integration of your application with um, services down the line in the, in the platform because you don't have an easy way to interoperate with them. And that is why we rely so much on federated identity management, the ability to translate a user's context from the web application to the compute infrastructure and the data infrastructure, as well as uh, other things. Um, right, so there's many, many other services in the commons, which we refer to there. Uh, and the, the urge here, as I said earlier, is for you to implement most of these things easily in your application. And we want you to avoid that urge to take advantage of the other services in the platform later down the line. So you will feel some pain in the beginning, but that will give you a big payoff later. Where can you get all these services? So if you take a look at that open science platform, we've tried to be as comprehensive as possible and whatever could be used to, to build a, a web application. But remember that there's no single infrastructure, whether that is one that you know about or one that's coming down the line, that will do everything that you want. This is just the nature of um, public infrastructure. You need to access lots of different things to do what you want um, and, and maintain the freedom of your application that you desire. Otherwise, you get stuck into that situation you had before where the middleware or the platform de defines what you can do. We want to break that pattern we want to say, okay, you're free to do what you can do, but to do that, you need to use lots of different infrastructures and services. The way you can do that without uh, suffering too much is by adopting these open standards and by building 12-factor applications. By doing the first, you know that you can more easily access services from different platforms or different services. By doing the second, you know that when things change, when your application evolves, or if the infrastructure itself evolves, you can still offer this application and you don't have to rebuild it from scratch. 
And so that allows you to develop more easily what we call these open science applications. But most of all, I think the most important suggestion that we can give here is not to try to implement everything yourself. You may design your application and think, okay, I need this and this and this. But before you go and do that yourself, take a look around and see which services are available via a platform. And then plug your application into those via the REST APIs that, the, that those services offer. So what can you actually plug into? Um, if you take a look at the European Grid Initiative service catalog, you can see that there's a couple of services which you can use and the description of how to use them. Um, services which provide compute functionality, that may be high throughput computing, as in grid computing, or cloud or cloud container compute. These are uh, generic endpoints which you can send your workflows to, as long as you write your application in, in the right way. Uh, same goes for storage. On the next slide, we see services that um, you can use more close to home. Roberto mentioned the availability of these services in the Africa Arabia Regional Operations Center, and you can read about that more at africagrid.org. Um, we obviously encourage everybody in the room to consider using these, but also to join the platform to provide resources to it in order to uh, better support the community. This is a peer of the EGI, so it's basically the same functionality provided via local uh, resource providers uh, with a little bit of tweaks here and there. Okay, so again, we, these, these are not a unified infrastructure. This is not one thing that you can plug your application into. This is a federation of services, and, and it defines what we call an open infrastructure. That means that if you want to bring your own service, you can do so, and you don't have to uh, do things according to um, a vertically integrated way, but a more horizontally integrated way. We've spoken a lot about the various patterns that we see in uh, applications, spoken about the fact that there are 12 aspects of a good portable application on the web. We've spoken about the way of developing these applications to make it better maintainable in the future and about how you can expect to execute these applications and integrate with various services out there in terms of the various platforms that we have, grid, cloud, whatever. Um, let's talk about practically getting uh, this experience into our code base. So the most important thing to remember are these two things. Develop your application as if it were running on something that you have no control over. And that makes it a good 12-factor application. Remember not to give in to the temptation to develop things yourself in your own particular easily understandable way, but in a way that respects the open standards of platforms. These platforms will make it easier to consume and provide REST APIs. So that means that you can pull in functionality where you need it. Uh, we will go into the details in the next presentation about how to do that for the various uh, platforms like uh, the compute and the data. Um, but just because we want to support standards-based ac access to infrastructure doesn't mean that this infrastructure is going to be magically available. That means that you, you need to estimate how much people are going to be using your application and you need to estimate what kind of load that is going to put on where this thing is going to run. That may be quite hard to do, uh, initially while you're developing, but keep that in mind. This is this is not something that's going to just magically work out there. You need to have some kind of contract with whoever it is, um, financially or otherwise based, to be able to execute this application in the wild. And that comes down to integration. So the next slide talks a little bit about integration patterns. Okay, so integration patterns come down to three things to remember. First one is that everything is code. If you can't express what you're doing in some kind of code that is in a file that can be compiled and executed in some way, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, if you need to provide manual steps to doing any particular thing, and if those become more than the automatable things, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, only you will know what you're doing wrong, but when you find yourself, uh, let's say, clicking buttons instead of typing, then something is, is, is not right. So if everything in your application can be expressed as code, then, then you're doing good. Uh, and you're reducing your reliance on so-called magic wands, things that only you know how to do and which only you know when to do. And that is by its definition a manual intervention and something that you need to reduce because uh, who wants to be doing these things manually anyway? That ties into the next point about automating everything. So 
again, if you can express something as code, then you can execute it. And if you can execute it, then you should automatically execute it. So the more places that your application can run, the better chance of your people actually using it, which is a good thing. You should make the deployment and the configuration automatic in the sense that whoever wants to actually provide this application can do so with a minimum amount of efforts. Uh, if you look at any widely used application out there, whether it's uh, um, something that's running uh, via an installation package or just uh, downloading things from the web, consider the, the Chrome store, for example, if you want to put an application in your browser, there's so little effort involved in installing those applications that um, they make it very easy to use. You should aim for that. That's there's a heavy reliance on automation. The last point is to make things robust, and that is uh, it shouldn't work only if you do certain things. It should work even if you don't do certain things, or even if you don't do anything. There's no magic way to do that. There's no easy way to say, I am doing it or I'm not. But here are some considerations. First one is to reduce the number of so-called moving parts. That is, the number of independent aspects of the application. Um, this comes back to the insistence of having a a single code base, for example. But if your application depends on lots and lots of different things all getting just right, then uh, you should take a moment to reconsider. Identify and reduce the single points of failure. There are inevitably going to be single points of failure, but in, and not all of these can be uh, or should be um, removed. For example, the authentication mechanism may be a single point of failure, the storage may be a single point of failure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe even the network that you're running on may be a single point of failure and you don't have full control over them, but at least identify them and try to reduce them in the design as far as possible. Lastly, just remember that you need to test everything. And these tests, as we said before, in the continuous integration part of the presentation should be automated. Not all of them will be able to be passed automatically. So some of them you have to do manually. You won't be able to test absolutely everything, depending on how you're building your application, but aim for that 100% test coverage. And uh, then you know at least how your application behaves in certain environments. All right. Integration patterns still. So use the infrastructure as backing services. We've gone to great lengths to um, emphasize the fact that you should use backing services and infrastructures in a way that's independent of your application. So try to offload the compute or data heavy services onto these platforms which we've spoken about, the grid computing platform, the cloud computing platform, and use the open standards adapters to do that. Don't write native integrations. Consider the data parallelism of your research. That means that send your workload to places where the data is and not vice versa. Only move data when necessary because data is heavy. Uh, to move it over the network costs time. Don't, or as far as possible, try not to implement your own identification and authentication me mechanism, but use identity federations as far as possible. It's very tempting initially to just use some kind of uh, OAuth plugin, uh, like uh, delegate that to a, a GitHub provider or a Google provider or whoever you want to authenticate your people. But remember that you're going to need to translate that identity to different kinds of things using various um, services on the platform. So it's much better to use identity federations for the long term. Focus on the workflow. Don't try to um, get the user stuck into what you want them to do, but make sure that they can do the things that they naturally want to do. Identify which kinds of patterns you, users will or your application will be using. That's why we went into the trouble of defining them. Write the web application to guide the users in these workflows. Um, so not entirely open, but uh, trying to explain to them what they could possibly do. And most of all, automate the things that you know that they have to do and don't make the users do unnecessary tasks on the web application. You need them to spend as little time as possible pushing buttons and as most time as possible actually getting work done. All right, that is the last slide in this uh, presentation. And uh, I'm going to leave the floor open to whatever discussion we need to have or questions and so on. I'm going to.